Hello and, and welcome. You have joined the Christchurch Inner West live stream. A Christchurch Inner West is a community of God's people in the Inner West who have been transformed and are being transformed by the presence and grace of God in our lives. Uh, my name's Dave. I'm the site pastor at St. Albans Five Dock and am on the Christchurch Inner West staff team. If you're new to the live stream this morning, if you've linked in uh, through a link given to you from a friend, or if you've just stumbled across the live stream, we really do hope that this morning you sense that at the beating heart of our community is grace and hope and light. This morning is Father's Day. And for many, Father's Day is a day of celebration, and for others, it's a day tinged with sadness and grief. But for all of us, it's a day to have our souls and our hearts guided to our Father in heaven. Even the best earthly Father is only an echo or a pale imitation of our Father in heaven. So as we steal ourselves and as we ready our hearts and our minds and our souls for worship this morning, hear these ever-living and ancient words from Scripture. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Allow the lyrics and the music of the next song to guide your soul to your heavenly Father. Let's stand and sing together or sit and tap your feet as we sing 10,000 Reasons. Oh, 
worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. So bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship Him. If you can see me, it's a bit dark, isn't it? Hmm, dark. Sometimes we get a little bit scared in the dark. I do. I think maybe I'm going to fall over something or bang into something or, or maybe trip and hurt myself. When we're in the dark, it's a bit unsafe, isn't it? And then, you know, sometimes I come home late at night and all the lights are off. And I open the front door and I've got my hands out in front of me looking for the light switch. Where is the light? I feel a bit lost when it's dark. Do you? Have you ever felt that? Hmm. Well, watch this. I've got a torch. See what this does. Oh, wow. What does the torch do to the light? See this funny thing you can do? You can do all sorts of funny things with the torch. Can you see it through my hand? What about in your jumper? You can see it in the jumper. And this torch does fun things like this. It has a, um, it has, whoa, this is a great torch. But what does it do to the darkness? It takes it away, doesn't it? In a few weeks at school holidays, you might actually get the chance to go out late after bedtime with a torch. And then you can do things like this. Get your torch out and you can go looking. You can go looking. Oh, is there a possum? Is there a rabbit? Is there something that you can see now because there's light that you can't see in the dark? Do you know what? One day when Jesus was talking to a big group of people, he said this really extraordinary thing. He said, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Follow me and you won't be walking in the dark. You will have light that gives life. Hmm, what did he mean? When we're born, we can see light and dark. Even babies can see light and dark. But there's another sort of light and it's not what we see with our eyes, but what we see with our heart. This is the light about how we know who God is, how we can find God. And Jesus said that people who don't follow him are walking in the darkness. They don't know their way to God and they're lost. Their life is not free. They're scared. Jesus said that when you follow him who is the light, you will be able to see the truth about God. And when you follow Jesus, you will have the life that only God can give. That is life with him forever. And there's nothing to be scared about with God. In a moment, we're going to hear the Bible read, including these words that Paul wrote to the Christians. And he wrote, that they are to shine as a light among people of this world as you hold firmly to the message that gives life. The way we are to shine is to listen to and follow and be like Jesus. Last week, if you remember, we learnt that Jesus thought others were more important than him. He served people by washing their feet. What else does the Bible say? Well, 
in this bit we hear today, it says we shouldn't grumble or mutter about others. Hmm. We should not talk badly about other people because it's not something that Jesus would do. So, to shine as a light, we need to be like Jesus, serving others and speaking well of them. And when you do that, people will see you shining like my torch. They'll see you shining in the light, in the darkness. Now, kids, adults, this week, each night when you go to bed, why don't you ask God to help you shine like Jesus, to be more like him, shine in the darkness? And we're going to do that now. We're going to pray right now. Would you pray with me? Lord God, thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you that he is the light of the world. Please help me to be like Jesus, to serve others, to share and to be kind to other people with my words and with my, what I do. Father, help me to shine like a light, just like Jesus. And help me now to listen to the words of the Bible that I might hold firmly to these all my days. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. See you next time. Hello, it's Rosemary Mitchell and I'm from the 10am congregation at St John's. The first reading comes from Isaiah <clears throat> chapter 49 and we're starting at verse 1. Listen to me, O coastlands. Pay attention, you peoples from far away. The Lord called me before I was born. While I was in my mother's womb, he named me. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me away. And he said to me, You are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I have laboured in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and vanity. Yet surely my cause is with the Lord, and my reward is with my God. And now the Lord says, who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him, for I am honoured in the sight of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. He says, It is too light a thing that you should be my servant, to raise up the tribes of Jacob, and to restore the survivors of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nations, the slave of rulers. Kings shall see and stand up, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. Our second reading comes from Philippians chapter 2, reading from verse 12 to 18. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without murmuring and arguing, so that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, in which you shine like stars in the world. It is by your holding fast to the word of life that I can boast on the day of Christ that I did not run in vain or labour in vain. But even if I am being poured out as a libation over the sacrifice and the offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoiced with all of you. And in the same way, you also must be glad and rejoice with me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, Christchurch Inner West. Uh, my name's Richard. I'm the site pastor uh, here at St John's uh, in Ashfield. And it's my pleasure to open up uh, this next section of Philippians for us together this morning. Uh, would you pray with me as we come to God's word? Father, we've heard your word to us this morning and we thank you that you uh, are someone who wants to be known, who wants to reveal yourself to us and who wants to change us and grow us. And so, Father, as we unpack your word to us this morning, we ask that you be at work in us by your spirit to do that work, to make your word real to our hearts and to bring it to bear in our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
where do you look for inspiration? Uh, maybe you've been inspired recently by the Olympians and Paralympians gathered in Tokyo. Uh, women and men of extraordinary talent and extraordinary dedication, uh, often with stories of substantial challenges they've had to overcome in their own lives. They are exceptional human beings, stars in the world. And their hard work can lift our eyes, can't it, to see greater possibilities, to transcend the difficulties of our day-to-day -day lives as we look to something greater. Uh, but then, of course, the games finish, don't they? And we come crashing back down into day-to-day -day life in lockdown, the same restrictions, the same frayed tempers, the same boredom and frustrations, the same cracks that the pandemic continues to reveal in our own lives and households and in society at large. Uh, we need inspiration, don't we? We need bright lights in the world to guide us, to show us the way. But our inspiration is often short-lived. Often it proves to be a mere distraction rather than a real catalyst for change. In this next section of Philippians, Paul continues to unpack what it means to live a life worthy of the calling that we've received in Christ Jesus. The one who didn't grasp after greatness, but emptied himself in humility only to be raised in glory. And that story, Paul tells us here, has the power to inspire us and to change us but not only to inspire us and to change us. That same story can produce in us a work that will in turn give inspiration to the world. If you put the gospel to work in your life, then you will shine like stars in the world. You, me, us? Really? Yes. That's our calling, to shine brightly with the glory of Jesus. What does that mean in real life? Uh, that's what we'll see as we unpack this section of Philippians in a little more detail. We're going to do that under three headings together this morning. Light for us, light through us, and light in us. Point one, light for us. Uh, according to Paul in this passage, the first thing that the gospel does once you've been saved is to actually give you some work to do. Have a look with me at verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence... Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. The therefore is, as always, very important. Uh, Paul, you remember, has just finished his great hymn about the glorious humility of Jesus. And now he tells us that because of that story, we have work to do, to obey, he says. Obey me, Paul says. And as it's going to become clear, particularly when we get to chapter 3, what he really means is be obedient to the gospel of Jesus as I have taught it to you. And he says to do that even more now in his absence. Now, that is, he's saying to the Philippians, I'm not there to walk you through it anymore. I'm not there to tell you exactly what it looks like to walk this path. Now it's over to you. And what it looks like to obey, he says, is to work out your salvation. Uh, hang on a second. I hear some of you say back to me through the camera. Hang on a second. Are we saved by faith, not by works? Well, yes, of course we are, and this verse actually doesn't contradict that at all. Uh, we'll come back to exactly what those words do mean in just a moment. Uh, but part of the reason it might sound a little strange to hear these words from Paul linking faith and works, salvation and works, uh, is because of the words that come next. He says we're supposed to do all of this with fear and trembling. Now, that sounds a little strange as well, doesn't it? Uh, after all, don't be afraid is the most common command given in the Scriptures. But here we're commanded to fear, and it's not the only time either. The Proverbs tell us, don't they, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Uh, what that should tell us immediately from the get-go is that there, there must be a good kind of fear and a bad kind of fear. Now, fear is a very physical emotion, isn't it? You feel fear in your body. You tense up. You might even tremble. And whatever you fear overwhelms you so that you can't focus on anything else. It takes over your mental life, your emotional life, and has effects in your body as well. But that kind of whole body experience isn't always a bad thing, is it? Uh, take, for example, my experience the first time I went to see U2 in concert. You may or may not know that I'm a big U2 fan. Not exactly breaking news, is it? 30-something white middle-class Christian male likes U2. No big, no big surprise there. But the first time I ever went to see them, I had this uh, rather incredible experience. Uh, when the lights went out, you see, and the band were about to walk onto stage, one of my friends who was there with me looked across at me, and he said, Mate, are you all right? You look like you're about to pass out. You're shaking. And I really was. 
not because I was afraid, though, of course, but because I was overwhelmed by the sheer awesomeness of what was going on. I could hardly believe it was actually happening, and it made me tremble. Uh, Now, of course, uh, salvation in the Lord Jesus is much more exciting even than a U2 concert, isn't it? But the Bible, I think, means something like that when it talks about the fear of the Lord. The author of a recent book puts it like this. He writes, The trembling fear of God is a way of speaking about the intensity of our love for God. I can shake in terror as a soldier might under heavy fire, but I can also quake in overwhelmed adoration as when the bridegroom first sees his bride. The fear of God, you see, is what happens when you're overcome and marvel at the unspeakable beauty, the immensely powerful grace that he's poured out on us through the glorious humility of Jesus. It makes you tremble. How does that help us understand what it means to work out your salvation? Well, you see, the point that's being made here is that a fear like that, a love like that, a fearful, trembling love for God because of his grace to you in Jesus that absolutely must and certainly will change you. The salvation won for you in Jesus should make you tremble so fiercely with wonder and joy that you'll never be the same again. That's what verse 12 is telling us here. And notice just how carefully Paul words it. He doesn't say work for your salvation, does he? He says work out your salvation. He's talking about the outworking of the gospel in your life. To work out your salvation with fear and trembling means allowing the glorious humility of Jesus to reshape and energize your life. The story of Jesus, you see, is light for us. And our task is to let that light shine into our lives in such a way that it changes us and shapes us so that our story fits that same shape as Jesus' story. And when the bright light of that story gets into our hearts, it will work itself out in our lives. But what Paul goes on to tell us in the rest of this passage is that it'll make our own stories bright, shining with that light as well, so that the light of Jesus shines out through us like stars in the world. How does that work? Point two, light through us. What might it look like in practice to work out your salvation? Paul tells us in very practical terms in verse 14. Read it with me. Do all things without murmuring and arguing. Simple, right? How good is it when the Bible is so straightforward and practical? To work out your own salvation with fear and trembling means not grumbling and arguing. Done. Moving on. Verse 15. So that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation in which you shine like stars in the world. So don't murmur or argue. You'll shine like stars. Wait a second. Just sit with that for a moment. Don't murmur or argue, and you'll shine like stars. What? I mean, really? Surely not murmuring and arguing is far too mundane and everyday a practice to be on par with the stunningly beautiful stars in the night sky. Don't you think it's a little weird that that's where Paul goes, that he connects those two things? Let's dig into it a little bit more and try and work out why he's putting these things together. At this point, we should remember what's been happening in Philippians so far. Uh, Paul's urged his readers to live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, and he unpacks that a bit further by urging them to, in humility, regard others as, uh, as better than yourselves. All of this, he goes on to say, reflects the mind of Jesus himself, who humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. You see, the whole fabric of Paul's argument here is that those of us who follow Jesus should live with the same kind of humility that he's displayed before us. Not grasping for what will make us greater, but living lives of humble service. And what all that context tells us is that not murmuring and arguing is an outworking of that gospel humility. How so? Well, murmuring is a a kind of secret talk, isn't it? A behind-the-scenes grumbling about other people who perhaps don't agree with you or don't do things the way that you would do them if you were in their shoes, especially when it's inconvenient for you. A murmurer is always grumpy about what other people are doing, but of course never does anything wrong themselves. What murmuring does is to make your own disappointments and disgruntlements the centre of the universe. It's a textbook case of what Paul, back in verse 4, called looking to your own interests instead of the interests of others. 
uh, arguing is much the same. Uh, Paul, of course, isn't suggesting that you should never talk things out or try to persuade someone else to change their mind or behaviour. He's doing a bit of that, even here in Philippians, isn't he? No, what he's talking about is the kind of person and the kind of community that's characterised by a constant need to correct and cajole others until they come around to your point of view. Paul, by contrast, has urged his readers to be of the same mind, to be of one mind, not meaning that everyone has to think exactly the same way about everything, but they should have a shared sense of the deep things that matter most. Arguing constantly about every little thing is a textbook case of what in verse 3 is called selfish ambition or conceit, regarding others as less than yourself rather than better than yourself, presuming perhaps that your own perspective and opinion and knowledge are superior. Murmuring and arguing are anti-humility, grasping kinds of behaviour, and they destroy communities. But what does a community characterised by the glorious humility of Jesus look like? Well, that's going to be a community in which differences and disagreements and difficulties can be respected and worked through with grace and kindness. Where the bright light of salvation through the glorious humility of Jesus is worked out in lives together, there'll be a community in which differences, disagreements and difficulties don't lead to divisions. And a community like that, Paul says, will shine brightly like stars in the world. Because while on the surface it doesn't sound very impressive, that's exactly what our world needs, isn't it? Just think about it for a moment. Don't you think murmuring and arguing is a pretty perfect description of the world in which we live? And not just the world at large, but our own particular patch here in the inner west of Sydney, in Five Dock and Haverfield and Ashfield. Murmuring and arguing is basically what we do, isn't it? And the pandemic that we're currently facing has made that all the more obvious. We've all got an opinion to share about whether the authorities were too slow to enter lockdown or whether they've gone too far. Having an opinion is fair enough, but we feel the need to air those opinions in our conversations and on social media and to argue about them with our friends and neighbours. And those differences of opinion get elevated to a moral status, don't they? Those who think we need greater restrictions accuse those who don't of being reckless and heartless. While those who think that they've gone too far think that those who don't are weak-minded enemies of freedom. And so disagreements about vaccinations separate families and friends. And your own particular reading of the daily horoscopes, I mean, sorry, the COVID numbers, define who are right-thinking people and who are just deluded. Could our city be described as a community in which differences, disagreements and difficulties don't become divisions? Not a chance. So much for all being in this together. Just as much as ever, and maybe even more, divisions between left and right, rich and poor, middle and working class, are drawing latte lines and all kinds of other lines through our city, aren't they? Do you see now why this is so important? Do you see the difference it would make to our world if we could be inspired by a vision of community that could get along despite our differences? A community where the glorious humility of Jesus is worked out in such a way that it refuses to murmur and argue you better believe that people like that will shine like stars in our world. When we think of stars, we tend to think of the exceptional, don't we? Olympians, Paralympians, the medical researchers who've achieved the impossible in creating vaccines for us. But as inspirational as they might be, they can't heal our divisions. Only the grace of God displayed in the glorious humility of Jesus can do that. And God has given you and me, his children, the task of reflecting that glory into the world. And if we can do that work, then maybe, just maybe, the crooked and perverse world around us will take inspiration from that and perhaps even take hold of the word of life for themselves. It's a high calling. What is it that will actually produce that kind of work in you, in us, that can inspire the world with a glimpse of the glory of the true and living God? Point three, we need also light in us. So, very practically, where has Paul gotten us to here? Do everything without murmuring and arguing. Easy enough, right? Except no, it's not. It really isn't, is it? Uh, you and I know that e uh, even such a small thing is really quite hard. And the ongoing lockdown with all its stresses, all its pressures, is probably making it even harder. Uh, just this week, actually, I was feeling pretty grumpy about something, and it was so insignificant that I can't even remember what it was now. But I do remember that I was murmuring about it, to Angus and Jonas and Dave and Andrew. 
And Andrew turns around and says to me, well, it's probably a good thing that you're preaching on this passage in Philippians this week, isn't it? And, well, he was probably right. Uh, The thing is, I'm really tired at the moment. And I know that many of you are too. And when you're tired, even little things can all of a sudden become big things, can't they? But you see, it's not the case that lockdown has somehow made me more focused on my interests and less humble. Lockdown hasn't actually made me worse. It's even worse than that. Lockdown's just revealed what was already in my heart and brought it out, as any crisis tends to do. And I'm sure that many of you are feeling that in your own households, in your own workplaces, and even with one another here in our church family together. And so, thank God, we're not left on our own to do this, are we? The work of working out your salvation isn't all on you. In fact, in the end, it isn't your work at all. Circle back with me to the beginning of this little passage in verse 12. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Uh, This is a profound and important verse, and I'd love to spend the next couple of hours unpacking it with you, but don't worry, we won't. Uh, If you needed any confirmation that work out your own salvation doesn't mean save yourself through works, then it's this very next verse, isn't it? For it is God who is at work in you. You see, when it comes down to it, we're so lost in sin and darkness that even to desire to put the grace of God to work in your life can only come about as a result of God's gracious work in you. Salvation belongs to the Lord from beginning to end, from the first moment that he opens the eyes of your heart to his love for you in Jesus, in every step toward maturity until you stand complete and perfect in the presence of the Lord at his return for all eternity. God himself is the source and the power and the agent of all of it. What are you going to do with that? What difference is that going to make for you as you seek to work out your salvation? Well, you might say, easy, If it's God's work, then I'll just sit back and let him do his thing. But that won't fly, at least not according to this passage here. It is God's work from beginning to end, and yet it's our calling to work out that salvation in our lives. You see, God doesn't just magic us into Christ-like perfection. He remakes us from the inside out, from the heart, so that more and more we love what he loves. And in his grace and kindness, he chooses to use us in the process. Uh, Knowing this is going to help you guard against two opposing errors in the Christian life. Uh, On the one hand, it's going to guard against overconfident complacency. And on the other hand, it's going to guard you against despair. You see, you can become overconfident and complacent as a Christian when you imagine that the grace of God leaves you with nothing left to do. I'm good. I'm good to go. I'm just here doing my thing. I don't need to worry about my own holiness. I don't need to seek to grow in that. But of course, you're not perfect yet. You're called to work out your salvation and not least because it's in your own wrestling and even failing that God will continue to humble you and so deepen your fearful love for him. On the other hand, you can become lost in despair as a Christian when your working out salvation leads to failure again and again and again. But you see, what this tells us here is that you're not alone in your work. God himself is at work in you. And if God's at work in you, his work will not fail. No failure on your part, no matter how significant, no matter how frequent, can derail what God is doing. He will finish what he started. How can you be sure of this? Well, have a look at the last four words of verse 13. Words of absolutely incredible beauty. Words that tell you why it is that God is doing all of this in the first place. For his good pleasure. You see, what pleases God, what brings joy to his heart, is to make you and me shine like stars in the world. Working out your salvation, learning not to murmur and argue, it's not easy work, but it pleases God to work it in you. And you can see the difference that that actually makes in Paul's life here in this passage, can't you? As we draw to a close, have a look with me at the final verses of this passage, verse 17. Paul writes, But even if I am being poured out as a libation over the sacrifice and offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. And in the same way, you also must be glad and rejoice with me. 
Do you see what all this has done for Paul, this work of God in him by grace as he seeks to work out his own salvation? You see what he says? Even if working out his salvation means death for him, he will count that as joy. That's the confidence of a fearful, trembling love for God, a love that can never be overwhelmed even when the work seems far beyond human ability to accomplish. What can sustain that kind of confident, trembling love for God? Well, it's only his love for you through the glorious humility of Jesus. The blameless and innocent lamb without a blemish, God's own son who poured out his blood on the cross as a sacrifice and offering in order to make crooked and perverse people like you and me into children of God. The light of the world extinguished in the darkness and raised in glory to make you and I shine like stars in the world. And why did he do it? Because he loves us. It was his good pleasure. And the more your heart trembled in the face of this great love, the brighter you'll shine. Brothers and sisters, this is what this passage tells us this morning. This is what the gospel will do in you. God has called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Shine as a light in the world to the glory of God the Father. Amen. gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer there is no more for heaven now to give he is my joy my righteousness and freedom my steadfast love my deep and boundless peace to this I hold my
complete Still my lips shall repeat Yet not I, but through Christ in me The bright story of Jesus, his story, is our story. It's the story of every Christian throughout time and throughout the world. It's a story that unites us together. And it's a story that's summarized in the Apostles' Creed. And so we're going to say together the Apostles' Creed now. So please join in with me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and he's seated at the right hand of the Father. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As Rich said, the bright story of Jesus, the story of Jesus coming down into our world and rising to new life, shines light into our lives. The story of supreme humility shines light on our own motives and hearts. And if we let it, it reveals in us something not as beautiful as Jesus' love and humility and sacrifice. It reveals grumbling. It reveals wanting to be above other people and not regarding others as better than ourselves. It reveals all sorts of things in our own hearts and lives. And so we come to the moment in our service where we get to examine our hearts and minds to let the light of Jesus' story shine into our hearts and to confess our sins to our almighty creator. So let's say this prayer of confession together. Together, let's pray. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our, heart, our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what leaves our consciences with a sense of condemnation. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open to us a future in which we can be changed. And grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Amen. We open our hearts to the light of Jesus and it's when we hear the love and grace of God spoken into our lives at our most ugly, we begin to change. So hear these words of God's grace and love, the love we see in Jesus. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is God's love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. At Christ Church in the West, we have a partnership with Compassion Australia. And so from time to time, we hear updates from Compassion. And so we've got a short video from Spiro Cassis, who works from Compassion. He's got a, an update for us and, and, and some action points for us to carry out. So enjoy. Christ Church in the West, it's great to see you. It's Spiro. I've met many of you, I've had the privilege of travelling to the developing world with you where you've met your sponsor children. We almost managed to do it a second time. Right now, could you please be praying for your kids? It's a really tough time. Kids have missed 18 months of school in some cases. Parents have lost livelihoods. In some cases, parents have died. And in some cases, children have lost both parents to COVID. We've also lost church workers to COVID. And yet, in the midst of this, many people are coming to Christ as it is the church, rather than the government in many places, that's providing first aid and the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, expressed in so many ways by sharing the hope of Jesus and showing the love of Jesus as resources are being shared. And that's being made possible by you. Please pray for Haiti. Two weeks ago there was an earthquake in Haiti. 47 child development centres and churches 
were either totally destroyed or very badly damaged. If you do sponsor a child in Haiti and there's been an issue with the child that you sponsor, if they've been caught up in it, we will call you. You may have also seen in Indonesia many people who have been affected by COVID. Loss of life, loss of livelihood. Please be praying for Indonesia. Please be praying for Thailand. Many people are fleeing to Myanmar and heading into Thailand. And they're experiencing the love of Jesus as they encounter big-hearted churches who are sharing what they have with them. Unfortunately, it has also meant there's been a renewed spread of COVID in Thailand. I want to thank you so much. I want you to consider the enormous privilege that we have. And I speak to you now as a sponsor, and I've had the privilege of meeting six of the kids that my family sponsors. Our words of affirmation through letter writing are very powerful. Our prayers are powerful. Praying for a child in the developing world by name and praying for their family is powerful. So please bring them before God. I also want to encourage you to think about perhaps sending family gifts. I know that during COVID, my own family has sent family gifts. One of the awesome things about family gifts is 100% of the value of what you send goes to the child and the family in need. And I look forward to seeing you again one day. God bless you. And uh, whatever you're going through now, may the Lord Jesus Christ bring you the peace and comfort that only he can. Thank you. Well, good morning. And as we remain uh, scattered physically, uh, nonetheless, we are united in heart uh, and in spirit together. And so let's pray to God, our Heavenly Father. Our gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we lift our hearts to you first in praise. You are good, despite the circumstances that the world is enduring at the moment and we ourselves in our own a particular way. You are glorious despite the tarnishing of evil that there is in this world. And you are love despite our sin and wayward hearts. We lift our hearts to you in praise, our good and glorious and loving and holy Lord. And we know that without you, uh, there is no hope, there is no joy, there is no future, there is no foundation. And so uh, we say to you this morning, that we rest in you, we lift our hearts to you in praise. We lift our hearts to you also in thanks, Father. These are very difficult times, and we know many others whose circumstances are even more challenging than our own. We thank you this morning for fatherhood and for fathers, for our own fathers and for our children for those of us who are fathers. And we're aware of, in many ways, the imperfections and failings and frailties that all of us carry with us and that play their particular function in fatherhood. And so as we thank you, we also know what it is to experience disappointment, uh, both with our own fathers and in our own fathering. We thank you that you are our Heavenly Father and that with you there is no disappointment, that with you there is perfect strength. And we lift our hearts to you in need. There is so much need at the moment. We pray for our gospel partner uh, in compassion. We thank you so much for that ministry and for the life, sustenance, strength, and hope that it brings as it serves children in developing countries in the name of Jesus. And we pray for Claire Steele as she continues to lead Compassion, for the many other staff who work here in Australia. But most of all, we pray for the children that we support, um, literally hundreds uh, at the, uh, through CCIW people. Our oh Lord, have mercy. Sustain them 
especially as they deal with a COVID a pandemic and its effects uh, so often far more severe than we endure now. We pray that at this time um, you would enable people not only to continue their support of children, but actually to pick up more children and to seek to, to extend uh, the ministry of compassion at this time of need even further wide. We pray, Heavenly Father, for our hospital system especially. Um, particularly as we've heard from uh, the Premier that it's likely to come under its greatest pressure in the next few weeks. Uh, we ask for your sustaining power. We thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, that you went about healing. And we pray that your work would continue in healing uh, through the hospital system. Uphold doctors and nurses and support staff in their weariness and fatigue. We pray also for our rulers. Uh, we thank you for the relative stability of government and for the relative high quality of decisions that are made, typically. Um, we continue to pray that you would uh, provide us with uh, rulers that act in the best interests of those whom they rule and not in self-interest. Uh, we pray that you would continue to minimise as far as possible point scoring and politics in relation to the pandemic. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would soon uh, bring uh, further and further relief from the pandemic here and across the globe. And so we pray for ourselves and along uh, with us, with our neighbour church, St Bede's Dremoyne. Father, we pray that gospel humility would live more and more intensely and substantially in us. Use the suffering of this moment to refine us, we pray. Strengthen us when we are weak. Encourage us when we are low. Uphold us and fill us when we are empty. Enable us by your grace to more and more shine like stars in this generation. And we pray these things all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's join together in the words that our Lord taught us, the Lord's Prayer, together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. I have three brief notices for our life together at Christchurch in the West. The first notice is that during the lockdown, we've started a Thursday midday prayer session on Zoom. So it's from 12 to 12.20 on Thursdays, and it's strictly 20 minutes, and it's an opportunity for us to sort of disconnect from our, our usual routines and, and lives to, to pray, to, to put a, a particular area of our local um, suburbs or, or our state or our world on the agenda and to bring it to God in prayer. So if you'd like to log in to this, um, to this prayer session, You'll find details in the e-news or on our website or on the Facebook groups. We'd love for you to join. If, you, if you're having lunch during this 20 minutes, that's okay. So turn your camera off and turn your audio off. We'd still love for you to join us in prayer. So it's Thursday, 12 to 12.20. Uh, secondly, our second Raising Kids event is happening tomorrow night from 8 till 9.15, and it's not too late to register. So Sarah Hindle, a clinical psychologist and also a a congregation member of St Albans Five Dock, will be addressing us and she'll be talking about um, a family mental health checkup. She'll be giving us the skills to monitor and strengthen the mental health of our families. So it will be a really practical evening and we'd love for you to join. Carers, grandparents, parents, um, you're all welcome to join and we'd love for you to join. The information for the night and the link to register is on our website and, and I'll direct you towards the stalbanschurch.com.au website um, for that information. So stalbanschurch.com.au, you can register there and I think it's in the chat as well um, too. And thirdly, 
Um, you'll also notice in the chat the links to our post live stream Zoom services uh, will be there. And so if you're able to, we'd love for you to join in our, our Zoom call just to say hi and maybe to hear from a few congregation members and to pray for each other. So that's after the service um, this morning. Finally, we've been speaking about the God who enters our story, the story of humanity, and who inspires us by the power of the Spirit and His work in our lives to be transformed into Jesus' image. Our God is for us. Sing with joy now. Our God is for us. The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. Let's sing with our hearts and praise our God. To send us out to the week, hear these words from Philippians chapter 2. Do all things without murmuring and arguing, so that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation in which you shine like stars in the world. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen.
worship your holy name the sun comes up it's a new day dawning it's time to sing your song again whatever Ten thousand 